All right, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, Jeff Redd, let's pay on to us and clean and uh, help coordinate this. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, our so, uh, housekeeping thing first silence, please, 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 please. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous group, we don't want to have to come around and hurt you. Um, and of course, somebody's cell phone went off about towards the end of Melanie's talk, and we had to, we had to hurt her. So no, all right, turn them down, check them. Um, we will be video recording the, uh, the presentation, uh, so uh, and have that available over in the, uh, the library uh, for, for viewing for those of you who might need to take extra notes along the way. Uh, obviously, we have other presentations throughout the day up until about four o'clock. Uh, at seven o'clock uh, tonight, in the same room, we have another psychology presentation, a uh, stone lecture with uh, William Liu. So. Uh, once again, everybody is welcome to, to come back to that and be part of any of the uh, presentations that are over the day. Uh, to introduce our, our next speaker, every, every symposium that we bring in uh, a young or recent alum, I have to say one that, it, you know, we're at least for into the next calendar year, uh, is probably the most recent uh, one that we, that we have brought in. And, and I'm really happy to have it. This is probably a little bit of a, a, almost a homecoming to you a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and some of you might recognize uh, Kyle from, uh, from his time here. Uh, so Kyle Holder is a 2017 August Standard graduate uh, in biology and psychology, and uh, is in, currently in the Accelerated Master's Nursing Program at St. Louis University. Uh, as you've noticed from the, uh, the description of the talk and the, of the bio, that uh, living with, and uh, working with, and dealing with a mental health is uh, something that the cows is passionate about, personal, and uh, really affects all of us in a number of different kinds of ways. So I'm really, really happy to have you on, on campus to talk to us. So please welcome Kyle, welcome back to the Augustana Campus Kyle Holder. Can you hear me? Everyone? I'll put mine. Okay, um, so you kind of stole my introduction, but hi, I'm Kyle. Um, just a small disclaimer, and he kind of even touched on it. I'm gonna talk about specific mental illnesses, uh, and not everyone with the same mental illness experiences it the same way. So um, just wanted to say that before I get going. So soon after graduation, um, I got married, uh, and then the day after that, we went on our honeymoon. And our honeymoon took us, uh, we flew out to San Francisco, we drove down the coast, went to Los Angeles and Anaheim, and then we drove out to Las Vegas. And that's where this story begins, um, the day that we were in Anaheim, and then we went out to Vegas. So uh, we went to Disneyland, because I had to go see the big mouse, I'm a big Disney nerd. Um, we had a pretty good day, decided to call it early, uh, hit the road. Um, hit the road and get uh, to Vegas. And for those of you that don't know, uh, it's about a four hour drive, straight shot from Anaheim to Vegas. Uh, it's across the desert, you're gonna touch the Mojave, um, and you're, um, you have two or three stops at most. So with my uh, mental illness, that was something that already was starting uh, to draw red flags for me. So we start driving, my wife's talking to me, trying to just keep me occupied while I drive. Um, and the ride's going pretty well. And we get about halfway there and it starts getting dark. And then it hits me. It literally feels like someone had punched me in the chest. And it kind of starts creeping up and your chest is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then it feels like somebody's grabbing you by the throat and choking you. So I'm starting to think, okay, here we go again. My hands start to tingle, my feet start to tingle, and at that point, I know I'm not driving safely, so I pull over. And I look at my wife, and she goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine, I'll admit it, it's just another one. So, it just keeps getting worse and worse. My, well, my vision starts to get blurry, I start to not think straight, so I said, okay, I'm gonna go take a walk. Open up the door, walk out. Of course, it's nighttime in the middle of the desert. The wind's blowing. There's cacti that I can't even identify. Um, and I start walking around, and it's just getting worse. 
harder to breathe. Um, I start to kind of even wonder what we're doing. I mean, really, you don't really know what's going on anymore. Um, and without even thinking, I grab my phone. So I look at my phone and I go, okay, I'm going to see where we're at. And we're about halfway to Vegas. And so we got two hours left and I was like, okay, I'll ride this one out like I always do. And then it just kept getting worse. It got to the point where I truly couldn't breathe. So I was like, okay, I'm going to call for an ambulance or call for another hotel and we're just going to call the night. Um, and then I looked around and realized I was stuck in the desert. If I were to not be able to breathe, you're just locked there. So, and that was the first time I've truly been afraid of my own mental illness, was when I truly felt like I wouldn't be able to get the help I needed. Uh, for those of you who didn't know or didn't pick it out, I have a uh, panic disorder. Um, so I have panic attacks sporadically. They just come whenever. Um, I can't really control them too much. There's things I do to be controlled. Um, but that was one of the instances. But that was truly the first time I felt alone. So who am I? I'm just going to talk about myself a little bit. Um, I like to travel. This is a picture of me with my wife on the top of Mount Fuji. Uh, that was when I did the East Asia study abroad trip here. Um, so I like traveling. I've been to Europe. I've been to Asia. I've been to Mexico, Canada, all that. Um, I love music. Here's a picture of me without a beard. Um, <laughs> playing guitar. I love playing guitar. It's really uh, relaxing to me. Um, and then the picture of me giving the peace fingers uh, was over this past summer. I went to Warp Tour and met one of my favorite artists, Watsky. Uh, the picture right here is from Red Rock Canyon. Uh, that was the day after uh, that panic attack um, that I was just telling you about. Um, and then the picture way over there is a picture of me and my dad at Disneyland. Um, and. Yeah, so I really enjoy being around my family. I love traveling with my family. Uh, I take my studies serious. I really enjoy um, nursing, really love the program that I'm in. I uh, really do have a passion for healthcare. And then the picture of me wearing the Blackhawks jersey is at the Winter Classic in St. Louis. I'm a huge sports fan. I uh, love hockey and love baseball specifically. Um, so that's just a great experience. So in all these pictures, I look pretty happy. But what you don't see in these pictures is my anxiety and my depression. Um, my anxiety is my diagnosable mental illness. Uh, my depression is doesn't meet the criteria for diagnosable uh, as an illness. Um, so that's where it starts to tie into just mental health issues. Um, and it did impact my college experience. So for example, in this picture, you don't see the three Xanax that I had to take that morning so I could get on the bus just to make it because I was having such severe panic attacks. Uh, in layman's terms, that's about a bar and a half of Xanax for you kids that do those things. <laughs> um, the picture of me playing at that concert, I have no memory of. I remember almost all of my concerts that I played. Remember every, um, I still remember the songs. They're all terrible, but I still remember them all. Um, but I blacked out. I don't remember that concert at all. I was I just remember being anxious beforehand and don't remember that. Uh, the picture of me with the artist there, um, that was the day after I locked myself up for four days in my room over the summer. Um, this past summer. I was working for the, the River Bandits. I was doing a job there and then I was working at Subway. Uh, I had to quit my Subway job because uh, I just wasn't making my shifts. And thankfully, the Astros people were kind enough to let me keep my job. But either way, um, that entire day was just panic attacks after panic attack after panic attack. And the only reason I went was because of him. So I'm happy, but it was a rough time. Same here with uh, Red Rock Canyon. Uh, people with panic disorders are more prone. So if you have a panic attack, you're a whole lot more prone to have a panic attack soon afterwards. It's kind of that fear that you're going to have a panic attack that can actually make you have another panic attack. Um, so this was, so driving right back out into the middle of the desert to go to a canyon wasn't necessarily my ideal thing, um, but the wife really wanted to see some nature, so 
and then the picture of me with my dad was taken before I came here to Augustana. And honestly, the only thing I remember of that trip is being feeling depressed. Um, I had, I'm sure I had fun, but looking back on it, that's my memory is that. So a lot of the things I've done have been ran by that. Uh, both of these trips, uh, we had to stop about every half hour because of my anxiety. Um, I live in Northern Illinois, used to live in Northern Illinois, and driving down just to St. Louis uh, turned a five hour trip into a seven hour trip. So it's impacting my daily life, it's impacting how um, I behave. So depression and suicidal ideation. Uh, so I've talked a lot about my anxiety. Um, when I was in high school, I really started coming to terms with uh, that I had something wrong with me, but uh, really didn't know how to handle that. I have family members, I hear other people's family members say, oh, that crazy person, that crazy uncle, that psycho. Those sort of things when you live in a small town like I did uh, prevent you from doing getting the help that you need. And so not getting the help I need led to me having more anxiety attacks and being more depressed. Um, in general, just not being in a good state of mind. Um, and then I got to the point where, um, for lack of better words, I just wanted it to end. I was sick of the anxiety attacks. Um, I was sick of the panic attacks. Um, so I started getting suicidal thoughts. Uh, my dad and I hunted a little bit. Uh, so one night I went downstairs and I remember I just looked at the guns. That would have been my way out. Quick, painless, you would think. Um, but it's just, I don't know what stopped me, don't know what turned me around. But that moment kind of shaped how I viewed my own mental illness because I saw, that was finally when I said, okay, I really truly need to go get some help. Um, when I'm starting to think about taking my own life and I have a whole lot to live for. So what led to the speech? So my own struggles, uh, like I said, during high school, really didn't get much for help. Uh, I went to the doctor once and we started some cognitive behavioral therapy sort of stuff. Um, when I came here to Augie, I finally started on medication. Um, my mental illnesses, mental illness, mental health, uh, did impact my time here. Um, I was president of my fraternity while I was here, um, and I actually had to step down because I couldn't manage my own mental health and manage school at the same time. Um, I missed out on events with friends. I would avoid doing things um, just because I was afraid that I'd go out, do whatever, and have a panic attack. And then once I finally got to grad school, um, I noticed something a little odd. So you know how you get those new, when you come to a new college, you get a new email. Well, you come here to Augie, you get your email, and you probably don't get too many emails that say, X person has passed away. That's it, and then at the bottom it says, counseling services go here and here. Before I had even started at St. Louis University, I opened up my email and I had roughly seven of those notifications of students that had committed suicide while they were there. And that was just over the summer. So it's obviously a large issue around uh, campuses. Uh, friend suicide. So there was this girl that I grew up with. Uh, we went to Europe together, um, high school together. Uh, and she was actually part of the reason I came here. She was a student here. And last year she committed suicide. Um, and then looking back on my text messages with her and talking to her, I always kind of wondered why we grew apart. And a lot of that was due to, I didn't understand why she would lash out or why she would act like a completely different person. Um, not to blame myself, but there were things I could have caught and realized there's something going on. I could be there for her, um, could be part of a support system. Um, and then attending a larger school, like I already said, the email thing. Um, was a big red flag to me. So really got me wanting to speak out. So adolescence and mental illness. So your brains are developing up roughly up until the age of 25. Um, 
there's still some debate on that. It could be even upwards of 30 where your like frontal lobe is still developing. Uh, so your um, the decisions you make are affected already. Um, approximately 75% of all mental illnesses will be diagnosed by the age of 24. Um, so that's you guys. You're right in that, rate, that age group. Everything you do is affecting the connections that are being made within your brain. Uh, it's shaping how you're going to handle situations for the rest of your life. So what you're doing right now is very important uh, for your overall mental health. And then roughly one in five adults has a diagnosable mental illness. So if you look to your left and look to your right, you're probably seeing multiple people statistically with a mental illness of some sort. So mental illness is on the rise on campuses. Um, in 2013, campus counseling services reported that 44% of clients had severe psychological problems. Uh, that number rose to 52% in 2014. And these big psych psychological problems are depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and self-harm. Um, and those are the most prevalent issues. So differentiating between mental illness and mental health. Up until this point, I've talked a whole lot about mental illness. Not everyone in this room is going to have a mental illness. Um, so I just draw the line at what does the DSM diagnose as a mental illness? And the DSM is basically the Bible for diagnosing mental illnesses. Um, it changes. I think they just added gambling addiction, if I'm thinking correctly. Uh, and then the next big one that's kind of getting discussed is a technology addiction. It changes with the times. Um, and then they also get rid of certain illnesses. So you may be experiencing something right now that 10 years from now will be considered a mental illness and not even know it. So how we view physical and mental health. So your physical health, you don't tell yourself, if I'm not sick, I'm a healthy person. So me, for example, I could be healthier. I could be less healthy. I could definitely be in better shape but I'm not sick while I'm coming off a cold, but either way. Um, but we don't seem to view mental health the same way. We seem to view it as the absence of illness means that you're perfectly fine. And that's just not the case. Your mental health intertwines with your physical health and is on a continuum just like this, or just like your physical health. Your mental health could be better, it could be worse, it could be in a better state. So beginning to focus more on mental health, uh, the students, number of students struggling with the aftermath of a sexual assault is on the rise. Uh, I'm not gonna touch too heavily on sexual assault. Uh, I think that could be its own presentation within itself. Um, but people that are sexually assaulted um, do go through some traumatic experiences. They need a support system um, and definitely need to have their mental health taken care of. Um, so I was just going to make a small point about that. And then the number of students performing self-harm is on the rise too. So in this picture, it's a picture of me and my wife in Japan. Um, my wife is one of those people that harms herself. Uh, she cuts herself, um, usually like under the breast or on the, the wrist, uh, and that affects what she wears um, and so on. And I asked her why. And it's not as much of an issue anymore because she's getting help. She's going to counseling now. Um, and she said it feels like she feels like her life is out of control. And for some reason, cutting gives her that control. And if you think about it, every college student's life is a little bit out of control. You're hitting the real world, so to say. Things are changing. You may feel that way. So a lot of students turn to self-harm. So you don't need a diagnosable illness to seek help. Um, you can go to counseling services at any time without a diagnosable illness. Uh, it's not necessary to get the help that you need. And why do we avoid this topic? I personally think we avoid it because we view it as a weakness. Your mental health, if it's not in good shape, it's perceived as a weakness. Um, so if you're physically weak, you're looked at as still having other attributes that you can contribute to society. An employer may look at you and say, oh, well, we can do this with you. But if you're mentally weak, you're not so 
you're not looked at so positively. So when you come into college, you have a lot of expectations for your grades, uh, your finances. These are negative factors that can impact your mental health. Uh, if you're like me your first year, you kind of just partied um, and destroyed your GPA. Um, and some people just not getting the GPA that you were expecting is one thing. Your parents have expectations for your GPA. You have expectations. You may look at your peers and say, they have a really good GPA in the same classes. What is wrong with me? And that can affect your mental health. Your finances, if you're still not writing off the high off the Christmas money, uh, at this point in the trimester, you're probably feeling a little low on funds. Um, that can add stress. You're in a time of transition. Um, you're going from living at home with your parents, relying on them, to learning new skills on how to live on your own. You're learning uh, in the classroom. Uh, as you get older here at Augustana and moving on to other housing, you have a lot of transition going on there. Your relationship dynamics are evolving. You're going from a certain kind of friend group to a different kind of friend group here. Your friends here are probably a lot more mature than they were in high school, partially because of age. Uh, your friends here, um, your friend group size might be different. It could be smaller, it could be larger. Um, and all of this can impact how you manage your own mental health and how they're helping you. We live in a stressful, driven society. So most of you probably, this kind of goes back to expectations, uh, you need to succeed. You have a whole lot of money invested into this college. Uh, and for those of you that go on to graduate school, you'll have even more money invested. Um, and society expects you to go to college and to get a good job and to support your families, uh, both men and women. So it's, uh, we live in the U.S. here, it's very stressful. And then technology, we can see everything that's wrong, wrong with the world now. If I watch five or ten minutes of the news, any news station, I'm a whole lot more stressed out than I was if I just avoided the news altogether. Um, and with your phone, for example, you can look up everything that's going on in the world in an instant. So technology can be a negative factor. So how are many college students coping with their mental illnesses and health issues? In a lot of cases, this goes without even noticing. Um, Self-harm, if you're like my wife, you turn to self-harm. Um, many other students turn to drugs and alcohol. Half the U.S. population, roughly, that has a diagnosable mental illness has a substance abuse problem. Add on to that, you're coming to college where it's the first time you probably have drugs and alcohol more easily accessible. So that can easily turn into a long-term problem having these substances available to you. So some positive factors on your mental health. So take a moment to look at the list. And you might be thinking these could be easily could be negative factors on your own mental health. And that's very true. Um, but your parents and your peers are your support system. Uh, your parents, whether you come from a split family, uh, you come, you were raised by grandparents, for example. Either way, whoever your uh, guardian was, has known you for a majority of your life and is there to support you. Uh, your peers should be there su to support you. Stress and moderation can be motivate you to go get the help that you need if you have a mental health issue. It can motivate you to focus on your studies, which can lead to better uh, health outcomes. So these are actually all good things for your mental health. So what can you do for yourself? How many people, just by show of hands, know where Counseling Services is on campus? About three quarters. It's actually a lot better than I expected. Um, I never knew while I was here. Uh, it's up in Founders 206, if you didn't know that. Um, and there's the number for Counseling Services. Um, they do uh, appointments for people that have mental illnesses, don't have mental illnesses, uh, and they also do emergency uh, counseling. So if there's one of those instances where you need someone that day, uh, there's a number you can call on the Augie website that will get a counselor to you right then. Um, you can uh, engage in meditation. 
meditation and mindfulness training can be extremely helpful um, just for your own stress levels for your own mental health uh, I do it at night helps me get to sleep uh, I know some people that do it in the morning you do it's easy it's on an app you go through the whole process uh, but that's a great way um, to keep your mental health in check time management I'll go right back to sleep I'm one of those with my anxiety disorder I have to get five hours of sleep or eight hours of sleep don't ask me why it's one of those two or else it's all messed up uh, I think it has something to do with the REM cycle and the sleep cycle but if I'm out of that I'm way more prone to panic attacks all day long so my sleep is very important to me now if you don't get enough sleep even if you don't have a mental illness you're not preparing yourself for the day ahead you're going to be less likely to manage things well throughout the day and then you can even get to um, setting up your schedule properly so you have time to join clubs and go hang out with friends and go do all the fun stuff that you want to do while you're in college um, that actually can be a good release and then focusing on the right aspects of technology so if you pick up your phone you can download apps for meditation time management you can uh, um, join groups of people that are going through similar situations as you um, you can go on YouTube and find a million positive stories about people's colleges college experiences mental health whatever you're passionate about these things can help your mental health so what can you do for others so if someone comes to you and this happens to me quite often uh, with a mental health issue what do you do first thing to do would be to listen uh, if you listen to them uh, just them getting that out can be very therapeutic I know I bug plenty of my friends when I just send them a text and say I'm an event um, but just getting it out can be very therapeutic you can offer to help which is a very broad thing to do how can you help someone who has a mental issue well you can do other things for them besides helping their direct mental issue you can drive them to therapy you can drive them to counseling you can help them plan their schedule um, you can um, what else oh yeah you can just hang out with them uh, just things like that getting them where they need to be educate on your yourself on the issue at hand so if someone came to me with bipolar disorder I might not know exactly what to say so I'll get done with the first conversation a 10 20 minute Google search and I could have a whole lot better educated conversation with that person later on focus on your own health if you're helping other people uh, it can take a toll on your own mental health that can be rough um, you may be too empathetic and take on some of their stuff uh, so you need to focus on your own health I like to think of it as like going to the gym and if you're trainer is in worse shape than you do you really want to go to them same with mental health be in, make sure your mental health is where it should be and you'll be uh, better able to help others follow up and support so don't just help them once and say oh they're out on happy island it's all good uh, never have to worry about that again just showing that you still are going to continue that support can help accelerate how fast that person will recover from whatever issue is at hand. If suicide comes into play, reach out for professional help. Um, I believe personally that at a certain point, that you as a student and at your age, uh, there's not much you can do. Same with me. I'm considering I'm the same age as you guys. Uh, professional help, they, those people really know how to manage that situation a whole lot better. Uh, if you see anything on social media like Facebook for example you can report it um, it's really cool if you if this comes up you can just type in like Facebook suicidal post and Facebook's page is right there it's one quick sheet you copy and paste it's all anonymous um, and what they do is like they do with your cookies uh, they'll say oh Kyle likes shopping for t-shirts I'm gonna put t-shirts up on his page same thing with this they'll put mental health hot, health hotlines um, if someone deems that it's a bad enough issue they'll send a direct message to that person and say hey Facebook has noticed that there is an issue with possibly in this post here's some help would you like some help what can we do for you 
So even on these social media sites, um, you can help someone with a mental illness. So this is from the University of Michigan. Um, are you able to read it in the back? Yeah, okay. Um, and it's just what helps what hurts. I can't tell you how many times I don't know what to say to people. I would, you would think I'd be able to know what to say to someone since I have a mental illness and I've dealt with this my whole life. Um, but still, there's things you don't know what to say. So, I mean, even like, you're not alone in this, I'm here for you. Instead of, you're, you're fine, stop worrying. Um, talk to me, I'm listening, opens up them to get it out, opposed to, here's my advice. Here's my advice, instantly shuts down that person. Um, and then in the future, they're a lot less likely to come to you for help, because they're not getting the help they need. So I put this up on Facebook that I was going to be doing this presentation. And um, I said, hey, direct message me if you have anything you want to be said. I said, I'll do it completely anonymously. Um, and I actually had a few people message me back. And all of these people, I had no clue had a mental illness or struggled with any mental health problems at all. Um, so uh, just because I have bipolar disorder does not mean that I am unstable or just have crazy mood swings. Uh, that was one of the, I'd known her for years and never had a clue that she still suffered from bipolar disorder. Uh, more people on campus struggle with mental illnesses than you would think. You're not crazy or psycho just because you need therapy or medication. That is just an unnecessary stigma. I've been in that case. I delayed the medication I needed, the therapy I needed because of stigmas. Uh, many people wait to seek help until something drastic happens. If you even remotely think that you're suffering from a mental illness, get professional, a professional opinion. Um, I definitely did that in high school. I waited way too long. I was having panic attacks in classrooms and bombing tests and stuff like that. Uh, you don't want to be that person. And then your relationships with others can be costly. Don't waste your time or devalue yourself in your mental health for an unhealthy relationship. Uh, this individual uh, was getting physically abused. He was a male getting physically abused by his girlfriend. Um, and none of us ever knew it. Um, and it caused a whole lot of mental health issues for him. And you could tone that back down a little bit just to, to if you're in one of your friends is just kind of you know saying rude things to you every day do you really need that person in your life is that someone that you can rely on when you truly need them so put your peers um, on the table so to say so what are my goals my goals when you walk out of here is that you'll have a better understanding that your mental health is just as important as your physical health um, I hope that somehow through my story you saw that um, or that you'll learn from my mistakes and don't let your college experience be defined by uh, your mental health or your mental illnesses. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? You can feel free to leave if you need to. Uh, yeah, so she asked, if, is there anything that uh, professors can do if you haven't directly said, if the student has directly stated they have a mental illness? Yeah, okay. Um, I never had an issue at all with that, personally. Uh, I've heard of professors that aren't really big on the idea of um, getting the extra, like, allotted time for tests and stuff like that. Some professors could be a little bit more lenient in that. Um, not really. I mean, I'm not huge on this, the, quote, safe space. Um, I think college is a time where you're supposed to expand uh, your, your beliefs and your thinking. Um, and mental health is one of those where I think the discussion needs to be had. But I also think that I would be more afraid that students would use it as an excuse. I wish I had a more positive switch on that one. 
Uh, but yeah, no, I really felt like the professors here did everything that they could do. Uh, maybe switching it up for um, structure, a little bit more structure sometimes, that could help. Yes, well. I traveled you with you for quite a while, and I was surprised by your revelation so clearly. I was clueless. I don't know if there was something that I could have done, should have done, or or, or in another faculty member in, or friend in my situation traveling with with mm -hmm. folks who have mental illnesses that they don't want to reveal it or can't reveal it. Is that in your situation? Um uh, for those of you that know, Dr. Wolf went on the Eastern District with us. Um, I did bring it up to the people in charge of that trip, um, and there were discussions at points in the trip um, where if I felt like I needed to stop and take a day off or whatever. Um, the big thing, I guess, if you're talking specifically study abroad, uh, it is really rough just going nonstop. Uh, especially for someone with a mental illness. Uh, that was the issue I ran into. But getting students to actually speak up about it, um, I guess you could do it where it's more of a written thing, I don't know. Uh, so like you know how before a study abroad you have all those meetings before you leave, maybe just establishing that trust uh, that that's a priority. Um, that could be something. But I didn't think, I mean, I did struggle with my anxiety during that trip, but personally, I like traveling. I wasn't going to let it stop me from going to any of those places, so. I'm just curious if you can kind of talk about um, how you conceptualize I don't know, I struggle with the term mental illness, mental health, you know. Um, how, do you, how do you think about it differently based on the situations that are at hand? Um, you know, from my experience, I can't approach every situation and say, I'm gonna just fight this thing. Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of talk through some of, the, some of the thoughts that might be going through your head, how you approach different situations, and that's very kind of vague, um, my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, uh, mental illness is one of those things where you can't always just say, I'm going to bull rush it and it's going to get over with. Um, like I was talking about in my story with the desert, I just had to write it out. Um, that was my mindset. Um, i trying to think how to answer this. Clearly, I don't want to go off on three different conversations. Um, I guess the to probe a little more, yeah. uh, and I don't want to hijack the conversation yeah. um, by any means, um, but for me, I feel like at points it's necessary to refer to it as a mental illness because it is, uh -huh. and at other points, you don't want that to be, um, to almost feel like an excuse for yourself, yeah. um, and kind of it's hard in conversation to navigate even as we're having it right now, but I don't know if you experienced any of those and if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, a good example I can think of right as you're talking is testing. Uh, one of my tests uh, recently in grad school, uh, I was having a panic attack during the test and I said, it's grad school, I gotta be a big boy, I'm gonna just tough it through and I know the material. Um, and that was one of those where I took it head on and didn't speak up for myself. I wasn't gonna let my mental illness be an excuse for possibly doing poorly on a test. Um, I ended up doing well on the test and I'm not trying to brag, but like I, I ended up doing well on the test and I talked to the professor afterwards and she goes, you could have just walked up out of the room, I don't care. I mean, so I guess, Transparency is very important 
if you're open with your professors and you're open with your peers that you feel like you have something going on inside inside your head so to say um you'd be amazed at how many people are accepting of that because um, i mean and you get to the real world you get a job your boss will be accepting of that most likely i mean it's not like i could go miss five days of work as a nurse i hope i answered your question to an extent Yeah. So oftentimes I find that people have negative stigmas or in addition like wrong stereotypes about mental illnesses and how do you best address people who don't have the, the right information or mm -hmm. only based on knowledge of, me of certain mental illnesses based upon those negative stereotypes and stigmas? <coughs> I love that question. Yeah, them. yeah, I love that question. Um, I actually should have touched more on that. Um, I tend to approach those situations where someone has a, a stereotype that they're using um, and flat out kind of laugh at it. I, that's just my personality. I find it humorous. Um, but at the same time, they just don't know. So you can try your best to educate them. And, and by educate, I mean don't, you, you gotta listen before you're gonna speak and change someone's opinion on something. So if someone's being uh, talked about stereotypes and they're ranting, for example, I've been in a few situations where mental health comes up and they just rant on these crazy people and this and that. And you gotta let them get it out so they know that you're listening. And you may find something in there where they're not so far off actually. And you can use that to, um, to talk to them, to have a real discussion. Um, Internally, I laugh sometimes at it. I don't actually laugh at people. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people that are just ignorant. And it's not, I'm not using ignorant as a bad word. Ignorant in the very simple sense is just not knowing. So I think that uh, these stigmas that come out uh, definitely don't help. Um, but it's a good starting point of conversation um, as to the real issues at hand. Did that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing your story, Kyle. Um, so you mentioned that you didn't know where the counseling center was or counseling mm -hmm. services was located on campus. And so I was just wondering um, if you wanted to share your experience or think broader than just your experience on, um, you know, were there barriers or obstacles in your path in terms of using the counseling services on campus? Or, I mean, is there something that counseling services could do to uh, make sure that it's more accessible to students, whether that's like physically or accessible, or, or I mean, just putting it out there so that they know, we know that they exist. Yeah. So things might be a little different now than my freshman orientation, uh, but it starts there. Um, when you show up for your freshman orientation, you have the cool, cops up there making jokes and uh, talking about red solo cups and blue solo cups and they toss them around and they say oh well, if we find this you're gonna get a ticket that stuck with me I mean I still remember that um, but I don't remember counseling services coming up once so I think right out of the gate uh, counseling services like public safety which is very important too don't get me wrong but should be out there saying here's this number put it in your phone and we're going to hit you 16 times with this, so just put your number, the number in your phone the first time. Um, and I think people are a whole lot more willing to call. Um, I've called public safety for flat out. You find someone too drunk, passed out on the sidewalk. Well, I can call public safety. It's already in my phone. Opposed to I'm having a panic attack. It's been going on for a while. I have to look it up. And this, this sounds terrible, but I'm just too lazy to go look it up. So I think that would be a good thing counseling services could do is hit the freshmen right away, first years. Hit the first years the second they walk through that door. Um, yeah. In the back. You mentioned a lot about your study abroad experience. Uh -huh. um, I, I didn't have the opportunity to do that in my time here, but um, I'm assuming that any supervisor has some sort of medical form on students involved, whether it's something about asthma. Yep. 
Uh, I don't remember if there specifically was. I did put it down. I know I put down my panic disorder. Uh, the big thing I, it, it says any physical issues, if I remember right, um, I was needing three months supply of medication. Uh, so that was part of the, the process there. But yeah, if, uh, yeah, if you did do a study abroad, that would be good. Any psychological problems, issues, mental health? Um, because there were uh, some people on our trip that did struggle. Um, I think one of them ended up dropping the trip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, like, yeah, because I never felt on my study abroad that the professors didn't care or didn't want to know that stuff. There are different roles for sort of the director of the program. Yeah. And had access to those forms as, as an instructor, I was not privy to that. Yeah, I guess maybe a little bit of that, or, I mean, even as simple as just a, you sign here and you agree that the rest of the faculty that's going on the trip can see all this information. Something that simple. Uh, and if Dr. Wolf, for example, would want to go and look at that, I mean, a few minutes out of his day, he could just look at one spot on every paper and know. Um, and that comes into play, I mean, if we were in the middle of, we were halfway up the Mount, of Mount Fuji and I start having a bad panic attack, they're gonna think that I'm having um, oxygen issues. And that's not the case, I'm having just a panic attack. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, yeah, I guess there should be a little bit more transparency on and maybe should be looked at in the future. Yes? Um, I actually recently went to New York for the fall program. We did have um, mental health like, forms and stuff, so I don't know if that recently changed and certainly just for that trip. Uh -huh. um, but we had some pamphlets about it. Um, but I was also going to ask you, for like, on campus, like you talked about counseling services, do you think there's another way, like not just like professors, but other students like EA just your mentor group can get um, educated on mental health issues and be like a person, like a peer that um, students could feel like they're free to go to? Like, do you think implementing something like that would be more beneficial for students? Yeah. Um, is NAMI still an August Anna connection, right? Uh, like if the NAMI club, for example, uh, just one, one day at the beginning of each uh, semester coming up, I guess, because you guys are switching semesters next year, right? Um, at the beginning of each, just go over that uh, with each of them and just educate on what they could do for their students, maybe something like that. Um, yeah, there could be, that'd be a good way to get people in the halls that can directly help students. It also, to an extent, falls back. I mean, so if your CA sees something going on, they should report it. Like, it could be the same way. Does that help? Uh, but uh, at the same time, you're talking about a student. If I had more time to think, I could probably think of some really solid answers to that one. <laughs> but that's great. I mean, that's the kind of question um, if you are a CA or you're talking to your CA, bring that up. Or uh, I forget the guy's name who's in charge of assigning CAs and all that. Uh, he's really talkative. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, let's say that you're talking to someone that has their own issue with the apology, like person that they come to for help, but you're dealing with your own problems and your own mental health. Is there like a line to draw where maybe it's not so good to discuss those things because you have to focus on your own health first? So I just got done reading the TED Talks book for this lecture. Um, on how to speak better, because I'm a terrible speaker. Um, and one thing they said in there was, you better have all of your stuff finalized and sorted out internally before you would go and tell other people about it. 
But I'm standing up here today, working through my own issues, talking to you about it. Um, so my point is, you don't necessarily have to have all of your issues sorted out. Uh, but if you do feel like taking on that person's uh, problems, I guess I'll say it that way, uh, or what they're struggling with or what they're going through, if you feel like that's going to have a negative impact on you, you probably aren't going to be able to help that much, um, especially in the long term. So, does that help? Yeah, I guess. I'm terrible at questions like this. See, in grade school, all we do is fill in bubbles. <laughs> Either I know how to trach you or I don't. Any other questions? Don't be afraid. I just told you that I almost committed suicide, so. <laughs> That's a terrible joke. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I do really, uh, I'm really happy that all of you came out to listen to me.